Okay, so after talking about the benefits of mean variance optimization, it's only fair that we talk about the criticisms. The output of mean variance optimization, very, very sensitive to small changes in the inputs. If you change the expected return on an asset class or two using your input data, you may actually get vastly different output. Now, the efficient frontier generally doesn't shift significantly in total. However, the asset allocation for any point along the efficient frontier may actually change significantly. So in other words, your portfolios, as you look at them, along the efficient frontier, well, the weights may change quite a bit due to relatively small changes, minor changes, in the input data. So that's one criticism, is that, boy, you only need to change the data a little to change the results quite significantly. Now, some other issues is that the allocations are often concentrated in a few assets. So if we looked in that uh, prior example from the prior module, one of those corner portfolios, you put 100% of your money in real estate. You didn't put a penny, you didn't put a yen, you didn't put a euro into um, bonds or domestic stocks or non-domestic stocks. You put it all in real estate. That's probably not what we typically think of as an efficient portfolio, one that's 100% weighted in one asset class. But that's what the input data from that period of time told us to do. That gave us that output based on that input. And so what that means is that, yeah, these things are somewhat concentrated depending upon the time period that you look at just by how the data lays from the historical period that you pull in to your optimization software, you may get very, very concentrated portfolios, which, you know, the software is working properly. It probably should give rise to a question in your mind as to whether the input data is fully representative of what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so how do we solve this? The first two criticisms can be addressed by modifying the mean variance optimization process. The first thing we can do is a reverse optimization. So instead of starting with asset class data, and use that to inform what the optimization is going to create for us for the efficient frontier. What we do is actually start at the top with some information about the market portfolio, expect to return standard deviation correlations with asset classes of that, and then use that to inform what the asset class expected returns and standard deviations and correlations should be. So we can start at the end, so to speak, and work our way towards the beginning, if you want to think of it that way. We can also do something called black Litterman optimization. Basically, so black is Fisher Black of the Black-Scholes option pricing formula, the Nobel Prize winner. So, uh, so this idea, basically, we take some selective views that we have as managers or maybe even the client imposes these to adjust the market expected return. So let's say, for example, I've got a client who um, wants us to manage their portfolio, but they were a tech entrepreneur. And so they have some insight into the market for that sector. And so as a result, we may be able to use their views to be able to change what we think the expected returns will be for that sector of, let's say, the U.S. stock market. And so by um, taking those views and putting them into the data, well, then obviously that's going to change the optimization based on those views. So what we can do is take that reverse optimization, the black Litterman, basically two ways of tweaking the process. Another thing we can do is that in a standard mean variance optimization is we can add more constraints and basically force the allocations more to a middle ground. So I may say, you know what, I don't care what the data says. I'm uncomfortable with a portfolio that doesn't have at least 10% of its money in bonds or at least 10% of its money in stocks or I don't want to see a portfolio allocation as being efficient that has 90% in real estate. So what you can do is add constraints to basically steer those allocations towards the middle. In other words, trying to say that, okay, the data may not be fully expressing what we think our market views are, and so we use those constraints to steer it in what we think is a better direction. Okay, now let's look at reverse optimization and black Litterman a little bit more closely. So the reverse optimization, what do we do? First, we solve for and use the world market expected return data to select the client's portfolio. Like we said, we start with the market portfolio and use that to inform um, what we think the expected returns on the various asset classes should end up being. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use the world market asset weights use those correlations, those standard deviations, run through our mean variance optimizer, and then use that to figure out how much we should be investing in each asset class and then what the expected return standard deviations should be for all of those asset classes. So hopefully that meets some sort of consensus expectations. If we're taking the world market data and using that to work our way down to the individual asset class level data, well, then hopefully the goal here is that it gives us and optimization and a set of results, well, that's a little bit easier to live with, sort of meets consensus expectations. Now, Black Litterman, on the other hand, what we're going to do here is that we're going to look at the data from the world market, and then we're going to view adjusted, all right? That's awkward sounding phrase, but the idea is that we have a point of view, 
right? In my example, we have a tech entrepreneur as a client who feels very strongly about that sector. And so what we do is we take that point of view and we use it to adjust the expected returns of our input data. All right, and so the idea here is that once we make that adjustment, well then obviously the output, the efficient frontier and the um, efficient portfolios along that frontier are going to change and incorporate that information. So once we do that, then we rerun that mean variance optimization, and then yes, we expect those views to then be carried out in terms of what we're gonna see as the portfolio allocations. Okay, another thing we can do is resampling. So basically what we're doing here is to say, yeah, we have some guesses, right, of what we think the expected returns are going to be, but obviously these are educated guesses. They're subject to estimation errors. Yeah, I think, um, let's say non-domestic stocks are gonna have an expected return of 11% per year, but it could be 10, it could be 12, could be nine, could be 13, could be anywhere in between, maybe even outside of those values. So we have some estimation errors. And so what we do here is we resample the data. We don't just take the data as set in stone, run an optimization, act on that optimization. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna resample the data. And what that's gonna do is that it's typically gonna give us more diversified asset allocations because what's gonna happen is we're gonna allow these expected return estimates to kind of wiggle around back and forth, keep resampling and rerunning the mean variance optimization and get a different result each time. And so then as all these values kind of converge and kind of average together, well then we should be much less likely to having these kind of corner solutions where we're 100% bonds or 100% stock or 100% real estate. So that's gonna address that criticism number two, the fact that we quite often have very concentrated portfolios when we run mean variance optimization. Now the process. So like I said, we start with the basic mean variance optimization, our best guess estimates of the expected returns, correlation, standard deviations, okay? So that's data set one and output one, but we don't stop there. What do we do next? Okay, so then we can use something called Monte Carlo simulation, right? Hopefully you're familiar with that term by now. You've at least heard it once or twice. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna randomly vary the expected return. So we say the expected return estimates themselves have a mean and a standard deviation of their own. So we allow them to vary randomly along that distribution for each one of those values that we impose in the model. And so each time we sort of change those expected returns of those asset classes, we rerun the mean variance optimization again, and each time we do it, we're gonna get a new data set and a new output set. And so we can rerun this as many times as we want. We can run this thousands of times. Here we're gonna do it three here in this example, but we could run this thousands of times given the computing power that we have. And then what that's gonna help us do is help us converge to um, better, more diversified, more balanced portfolios, which we typically think are gonna help accomplish our goals with a little bit more reliability. So in the example here, we're considering a sample with three data sets, okay? So 7% return here. So look down at that footnote at the bottom, it says, you know, details vary. You could specify a target standard deviation, relative standard deviation. Here we're targeting a 7% return, all right? So data set one, 60% equity, 40% bonds, okay? Data set two, 60% equity, 30% bonds, 10% real estate. And then data set three, 30% equity, 50% bonds, and 20% private equity. Okay, so we have a sample of three data sets, right? Three different asset allocations, All right? Now, the resampled allocation, what are we gonna do? We're basically gonna take a conglomeration of those three data sets, okay? So the resampled allocation is gonna give us what? It's gonna give us 50% equity. Why is that? Well, if we add up those percentages, and divide by three. If I take 60 plus 60 plus 20, that gives me 150. I divide that by three. That gives me a resampled allocation of 50% equity, all right? Now, how about bonds? We had 40% bonds in data set one, 30% in two, and 50% in three. I add those three together. That gives me 120%. Divide that by three because we have three data sets. Now my new resampled allocation is 40% bonds. How about real estate? Well, real estate only appeared in data set number two, 10%, okay? So I take that 10%, I divide it by three, so that gives me 3.33% in real estate. And then finally, um, private equity only appears in data set three with a 20% weight, so I take 20 divided by three, and that gives me a weight of 6.67%. All right, so my resampled allocation becomes what? First of all, the weights aren't as extreme because they're the average 
across all of those three sets of output. And notice also, it makes sure that we get an allocation that includes all four of those asset classes rather than just three. All right, so we get those four asset classes that we want, and so we have a more broadly diversified portfolio, quite often seen as probably a little bit more reliable predictor of accomplishing our investors' goals. Okay, now some other criticisms. Mean, variance, optimization, whenever we're using those two moments of the probability distribution, that means there's a good chance that we're assuming a normal distribution. And that's true with mean variance optimization. We're assuming expected returns, standard deviations, follow a normal distribution. And so we know that that's not the case, right? We know that we're oversimplifying the world. So first of all, asset returns tend to exhibit some degree of skew, either positive skew or negative skew. It's another way of saying there's an asymmetric distribution of return. In other words, rather than having it be a perfect bell curve where the left side of the mean looks exactly like the right side, it's kind of imbalanced on one side or the other. That's what we mean by skew. It also is a sign, or it also means that we also are underestimating the kurtosis if we're assuming a normal distribution. Kurtosis is basically the thickness of the tails out at either extreme of the distribution. Okay, So we know that asset returns tend to have a higher degree of kurtosis than is predicted under the normal distribution. They have fatter tails. What does that mean? We have more extreme positive events, more extreme negative events than the assumption of normality would lead us to believe. Well, if we were to lead our lives that way, it would mean that we would be surprised every time we had a market crisis because we would say, oh, this should only happen once every 500 years, when in reality it happens once every, let's say, 30 or 40 years. So if we um, underestimate the kurtosis, then yeah, we're underestimating the adverse negative returns. Hey, if I get surprised by a positive return, okay, that's no big deal. But obviously we're worried about that left tail kurtosis. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we can use a more advanced optimizer, right? Not Probably not going to be Microsoft Excel doing this for us. So what it can do is it can incorporate more sophisticated definitions of risk. So we can do something that tries to capture the effect of that skew and that kurtosis so that we're capturing these risk parameters appropriately. For example, value at risk. So that's something that we can use to try and sort of figure out what's the worst that can happen, and as a result, hopefully lead us to more realistic portfolio allocations.